The following podcast was made possible by the sponsorship of Teresa Leong Lee and by Catholic Digital Resources, where you can find downloadable faith formation resources and evangelization tools. Visit Catholic Digital Resources at CatholicDR.com to build your own faith and the faith of others. That's CatholicDR.com. Good News Ministries of GNM.org presents Footsteps to Heaven Life's a journey full of challenges. Sometimes we get stalled. Sometimes we get sidetracked. When we walk with Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit to the destination that God the Father designed for us, the results are better than we could ask for or imagine. And now, here is your host, Terry Modica. Hi. We're living in very tough times, right, in, in our church. And I'd like to talk about that today. And this morning as I was preparing to create this podcast, reflecting in my prayer time about what to cover, which, by the way, I've been preparing for the past several days, thinking about what to say. What does the Lord want me to say? You know, there's a lot of other very excellent podcasts out there and, and articles that give a honest, frank, boldly frank view of what's going on in the crisis of the church and, and why it's happening and the corruption and, and, you know, how terrible it is. And we're getting riled up by this and for good reason. And I've been praying about what does the Lord want me as the director of Good News Ministries to be saying and sharing about this issue? This morning when I went to Mass, the first reading really spoke to me. And I'd like to start this podcast by sharing that scripture with you. It comes from Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 25. St. Paul starts out by saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And this is what we need to be feeling as well. In our very pagan society that we live in, our very post-Christian society where there are so many people now who don't have any church affiliation at all, many people who have left the church, you know people who are not filled with the faith that you wish that they would have. And you're concerned about them, but you're also living in the struggle, as am I and everybody else, living in the struggle of how do we deal with this? How do we speak up and not hold back the gospel? You know, how do we show that we are not ashamed of the gospel? How do we get the courage to not be ashamed of the gospel? In today's crisis in the church, I believe God is giving us the answer to that. Let me continue to read this scripture. Starting with verse 18 now, the wrath of God is indeed being revealed from heaven. God is doing the revealing, in other words, against every impiety and wickedness of those who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, how many clergy have you heard about, you know, and and you know that there's more that we're not hearing about, many more. How true is this today that through the unholy behavior of our clergy, The world is being led astray. They are suppressing the truth by their promotion of homosexual activity, by their promotion of of, of hiding the the truths about the corruption that's going on and, you know, hiding, um, continuing to let priests preach from the pulpit heresies even. You know, just one of my favorite examples is the heresy that in the multiplication of the loaves and fish, Jesus didn't do any miracle other than getting people, inspiring people to share their food. I've heard this way too many times preached about that scripture, and perhaps you have too. It is a heresy. Anything that that preaches against 
the divine miraculous power of Christ is a heresy. And this is one of my pet peeves, this particular scripture, because it works directly against the truth about the Eucharist, because the multiplication of the loaves and fish was a precursor, a foreshadowing of what Jesus did when he gave us the Eucharist at that last supper. But I've talked about that in a previous podcast. And as much as that's one of my favorite pet peeves to talk about, I'm going to get back to the topic at hand. For what, this is verse 19, for what can be known about God is evident to them, the people who are, are, are teaching false, you know, teaching heresies, people who are living sinful lifestyles, people who should be, who have been given the responsibility of teaching the truth to us and, and teaching us how to be holy by their words and by their example. God made it evident to them, the truth evident to them. And since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been able to be understood and perceived in what he has made. As a result, they have no excuse. And, you know, this was written in the first century. Now we can add to this, not only in what God has revealed through through creation, through, uh, you know, placing the truth in our hearts, through the Old Testament and through the New Testament writings, but also in the church writings that have been produced since the closing of the canon of the Bible. In other words, uh, when it was decided which books, which writings of, of, of the first apostles and, and you know, the, the scripture writers, which ones of those are officially you know, declared divine and is therefore incorporated into the Bible. And there were other writings that, that were not incorporated into the Bible. And, and since the time that that was completed, there have been what we call the teachings of the deposit of faith, the church magisterium providing us documents, providing us encyclicals, by, by holy popes and providing us with much material, the, the catechism of the Catholic Church, all of which is based thoroughly on scripture. We have a wealth of information available to us about what the truth is and how to live a holy life. The, the words, the teachings, the writings of saints is another example of what is available to us. So there is no excuse when our clergy teach us by their example, uh, by their lifestyles, by their, their preachings, they have no excuse when they teach us what is not true. But my friend, we too have all of this truth available to us. We don't need to go to our clergy, priests and deacons, to, to learn what the truth is. We have it just as available to us in every same way we don't go to seminary, but we can go to, to other ways of studying and learn as much as the priests learn about what the truth is. So we are all accountable to know what the truth is. None of us have an excuse for not knowing it. For although they knew God, they did not accord him glory as God or give him thanks. They became vain in their reasoning and their senseless minds were darkened. Does that sound like what's going on? While claiming to be wise, they became fools and, ex and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the likeness of an image of mortal man. And, and, and it goes on to explain some other pagan symbolism. But, you know, the exchanging the glory of God for the idolatry of in what we're talking about today of self, you know, I decide what is right and wrong and I decide what to believe about, you know, about homosexual activity or about, um, you know, when life begins or, you know, or about whether Jesus did miracles or not, you know, whether scripture is, is just speaking in symbols or whether scripture is talking about real miracles that Jesus did, whatever it is that is being taught to us in error, 
It comes from the idolatry of believing in and glorifying something other than God himself. I believe that God has been purging the church of these heresies, has been purging the church of abuses of all kinds. You know, for the past two decades, it began with what was the, you know, the, the, the scandals of sexual abuse of minors. And at the time that I, that happened, I predicted that God was not finished purging the church. You know, the bishops met and they made policies on how to deal with uh, the, the sexual abuse of minors and you know, they set up um, safe environment trainings in all the dioceses. You know, I myself have been through the safe environment training. It's required of everybody who who um, is in any contact with minors and with uh, vulnerable adults. And by that, vulnerable adults, they mean, you know, the handicapped, the elderly or whatever. And, you know, I've, you know, in that safe environment training, the, the, the question that keeps coming to me is, you know, how is this stopping anything? It does help me know how to recognize the signs of maybe that uh, somebody, a child has been abused and so that I can report it, but it doesn't stop the real issue of why the safe environment trainings were, were, were put in place in our churches in the first place. At the time when the bishops were meeting and planning and making their zero tolerance policies about about sexual abuse of minors, you know, I was dealing with a priest who was having lust towards me and other women. And because we were not minors, this was not considered something for the bishops to deal with. But I'm like, wait a minute, doesn't God want this dealt with? This is just as sinful. Uh, maybe it, it, it doesn't hurt it doesn't victimize uh, the adult as deeply as it victimizes children who are abused. But it's still wrong. It's still victimizing the church. It's still making a victim of Christ's own body. Because, because we have this corruption still going on in the church. I reported the, the lust... Uh, of this this priest um, to to the, my bishop's office, and there were other people who were complaining about this particular priest, and and nothing was done. It wasn't until he looked at a 16 year old in a lustful way, and I reported that that the bishop finally took action. And what our bishop did was move him to a different diocese. This was a priest who was on loan from from a, a diocese a different diocese and so our bishop sent him back to his own bishop and I I said please 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 tell that bishop that this man this priest uh, his lust is coming from addictions and you know he's an alcoholic and he needs to go to rehab uh, he might need to go to sexaholics anonymous in addition to alcoholics anonymous he needs help get him the help that he needs so that you know, he can be healed and, you know, it will help his own salvation and his, his own, what's going to happen to him, you know, in purgatory after, after he's died. And it will help the church and all the people that he serves. There, there was no help given to him. He was just assigned to a hospital chaplaincy. He was not given a parish because the bishop there did not want to subject the parishioners to him. But he was given a hospital chaplaincy and, and nothing was done to, to, to stop, to heal, to, to, to deal with the real situation. Years later, there was another situation that I became involved in with a priest. Um, in, this, in this case, it was um, a priest who was having homosexual affairs, but not with minors. Um, he had homosexual prostitutes come to the rectory. He had, um, um, you know, male lovers come to the rectory. 
And he was also very abusive uh, mentally and verbally to his staff. The, the, the staff was, were so traumatized by his abusiveness. They were so afraid of him that, you know, if, if somebody came around the corner, uh, you know, they, they practically jumped out of their skin because they were afraid it was this particular priest. They had post-traumatic stress syndrome and, and it was very real. And, uh, a friend of mine from that parish and I decided after, uh, you know, it had been reported to the to the bishop's office, and the bishop's office did nothing about it. They made excuses for for this priest, and it's like, oh, it, it's just his personality type. You have to deal with it, you know. And 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 the claims of homosexual grooming. There was a a youth minister, a young man, who told the bishop's office that uh, that he was. Um, after he'd gone to the safe environment training, he recognized now the signs that he himself was being groomed to be homosexually victimized. And, and he reported that and was not believed, was not, was not helped. He lost his job. And, and, you know, and so this friend of mine and I decided after a while of seeing nothing happening to change, to better the situation, we decided we had to do something. So what we did was we relied on the power of the rosary. The rosary defeats evil. The rosary includes the Our Father prayer, which begins with, you know, with glorifying God and ends with the defeat of evil. You know, save us from the evil one is, you know, how Jesus told us to pray the Our Father prayer. And the the reason why praying, asking Mary to get involved in this situation by praying the Hail Mary is because Mary is the Ark of the Covenant. Mary is, you know, she held, she, her body was a tabernacle of the Lord. She held Jesus within her body. And in the Old Testament, whenever the, the Hebrews went against the enemy, carrying the Ark of the Covenant before them, they won every battle. So we prayed the rosary as going into battle with this Ark of the Covenant, who is Mary, and with the Lord Jesus, because all the, the rosary mysteries, you know, it deals with, with salvation history. It deals with what Jesus did to, to bring us victory in battle against evil, to bring us to salvation. And so we prayed the rosary walking all the way around the perimeter of the, the campus of this, this church, um, the church facilities. And, and we did this every morning after daily mass, rain or shine, hot weather, cold weather. And sometimes people joined us on that. And every time we went past the office building where the staff who were, were was terrorized by the abusiveness of this priest, you know, they, they looked out the window and, and said, oh, they're praying for us again. I mean, just the fact that we were doing that ministered to them. But what my friend and I were praying for was for the priest who was abusive to be saved, to be delivered from the evils that caused him to be this way, to be delivered from whatever wounds from his childhood or, or whenever, you know, if something had happened to him in seminary, because that's, as we know now, where some of the abuses have gotten you know, promulgated through, you know, the um, uh, seminarians being victimized and then in turn becoming victimizers. Whatever was the root of his problems, we were praying for him to be healed, to be delivered from it, and, and, and to be saved from, from it and, and to be able to become the priest that God called him to be. And if we added in, in, our, in our lifting up the prayers, if he, this priest was not going to cooperate with God's plans for that, that we prayed that the Lord would replace this priest with a priest who was a man of God, who was a true man of his, you know, of God's own heart. And months went by we kept doing this and this priest didn't change he did tell us to stop praying the rosary and we kind of chuckled about that because you know that there in itself shows us that you know there was demonic influences behind uh behind this man's behavior and uh so we kept on going and eventually what happened was 
um, this priest was sent away on sabbatical and the parish did get a, a priest who, who was truly a man of God and helped heal the parish and help the staff recover from their post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, unfortunately, the, the priest who had caused all the problems, the, the homosexual activity was never dealt with. Um, the, you know, he was given an assignment, uh, when he came back from sabbatical of in working in a parish, um, eventually, you know, he was given other types of jobs, not in a parish. The problems were not being dealt with, were not being handled. And I knew that God was not pleased with that. And I knew that God was not done purging his church. And so I'm not surprised of what's happening today. I'm not surprised that God is finally bringing to light, in the light of Christ, the hypocrisy of, of clergy and others in authority, uh, sometimes, you know, it comes from parish managers. I've seen that too. Uh, and, you know, others in authority who are not taking a stand, a strong, clear stand against what is evil and are not teaching by example and by word how to live the holy life and how to be countercultural. In today's world, you know, the culture has gotten more dark more filled with corruption, more filled with demonic influences, demonic penetrations, demonic, um, you know, moral relativism that where our idol again is ourself, where we decide what's right and wrong. And, you know, we need to be all the church, clergy and laity alike need to be not ashamed of the gospel, but speaking up and living up against what the world is teaching what the world is, 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 is promulgating, you know, spreading, uh, you know, it's growing in the world and we need to take a stand against that. We need to be countercultural. And I believe that's what God is raising up now. He is purging the church in a way that is making us realize that we, the laity need to do something. The Lord has allowed the, the corruption in the church, the Lord has allowed to be given over to the ways of the world and the, way, the ways of demons. Um, and, and he has not uh, come down with a lightning bolt, striking them away from, from our lives and our, and our churches, our parishes and, 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 and places of, of authority and, and influence. He's not done that. You know, he could, but he's not. And why is that? It's because Take a look around at what's happening now. We, the lay people, we're getting all riled up, aren't we? You know, we want clarity in in the teachings that, that we, when the Pope speaks, we want him to be clear and he's not clear. When we ask questions of, of cardinals and we don't get clear answers, we get frustrated. We're not getting the clarity we want. We're not getting the, the teachings that we want, you know, and what is it that we really want? Let's face it. We want our priests to tell the world how to live and how to be holy. We want our priests, not us, to take on the hard job of speaking up against what is evil. Right? Let's admit it. You know, how many of us, you know, hide, cower, you know, when we're in a family situation, uh, many of us, if not all of us are in situations where speaking the gospel can be very uncomfortable around the people where we work, the people that we live with, the family members who, who have left the church or, um, or never found the church. And what we've done, and this began long before my time and yours, we have put priests on pedestals. We want them to be Christ for us. And that is their calling. But we want them to be Christ for us so much so that we look at them and we put them on pedestals. And when they fall off their pedestals, we keep looking at them and saying, 
you know, you're, you're bad. You know, I, I need something different from you. And, and I, I don't believe that, that, you know, I need to put you back up on the pedestal. Maybe you're not really as bad as I think. I mean, there's a lot of Catholics too who say, and I've heard this down through the years, um, I, I heard it first place, you know, in, in first hand when I was dealing with those two particular priests that I talked about, there are people who said, what you're accusing this priest of can't be true. And because we like to put blinders on, we want our priests to stay on the pedestals. But guess what? God doesn't want anybody on a pedestal. God says, put me first, put your focus on me and keep your focus on me. The first commandment, have no other gods before me. And what did Jesus say is the most important commandment? To love God with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole soul. In other words, to be so wholeheartedly focused on God that he is the one who guides us. He is the one who teaches us how to be holy. He is the one who is if we have to have somebody on a pedestal, he's the only one on the pedestal. I believe God is allowing things to happen today in, in this horrible way that it's happening, this way that gets us so riled up and frustrated because he wants us, the laity, to get riled up about our own calling to spread the good news, to spread the truth, to spread the gospel, to be countercultural, to teach the truth, to get clear on our own efforts if it's not available to us. Hey, if you live in a parish where you have clergy teaching you what the scriptures are saying and not just a few minutes in a homily every Sunday uh, and even every weekday if you go to Mass every day of the week, but you know, we have church documents and and this one here I would like to share with you. Uh, this is the decree on the apostolate of the laity. This is what in Vatican Council II, when the Holy Spirit inspired that council and inspired the, the bishops and, and the other people who were attending to, to speak about the, the church changing the world. And it included how we, the laity, are called to change the world and lead the world to Christ. I'm going to do a series on this decree on the Apostle of the Laity because this is extremely important. This tells us what our mission is as a laity, that we are not to be relying on the clergy. This document says that the role of the clergy is to support the laity in fulfilling our mission of of telling the truth, living the truth, evangelizing the world by the way we live and what we teach, what we speak, what we say, speaking up, not being ashamed of the gospel, but teaching what is true and challenging people out of love for them what the truth is, challenging them to give up the ways of the world and embrace the truth that Christ taught, which has been further taught down through the centuries in the teachings of the Catholic Church. We have a wealth of material that teaches us this, and we need to avail ourselves of that. And so this is why I'm going to share this document in upcoming episodes. I'm going to really get into what this says about your calling including the fact that the clergy's calling is to support you in that calling. Let's pray now for our openness to our calling. Come Holy Spirit, pray this with me please. Come Holy Spirit, fill me. Come Holy Spirit, renew me. Come Holy Spirit, teach me what you want me to learn. Come Holy Spirit, help me to know the truths that I'm not hearing clearly from the clergy anymore, or I'm not hearing enough from the clergy. I haven't learned enough. And instead of relying on the clergy, I need to rely on you, Holy Spirit, to teach me because Jesus said that he would give us the Holy Spirit to teach us what we need to know. Come Holy Spirit, teach me. Come Holy Spirit, 
Set me on fire to teach the truth to others. Help me to gain clarity from you, Holy Spirit, and then give that clarity to others. Come, Holy Spirit, you have my permission to change me. And we pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You've been listening to Terry Modica of Good News Ministries. For more faith builders, or to learn more about this ministry, come visit our website at gnm.org. You'll find online resources and lots more to help you know the Father's love and grow closer to Christ and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Visit gnm.org today.